Good morning, my name's Jim Walker. I'm the pastor of Revival from Down Under in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne in Australia. Hallelujah. I'm saved and I'm going to heaven and I'm happy about it. Glory to God. I'm going to speak this morning on a topic I have called the resurrections. The resurrections. And we're going to begin by reading 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 where the Apostle Paul tells us that we are to study, speaking of God's word, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now this tells me that Scripture can be rightly divided, and if it can be rightly divided, it can also be wrongly divided. Amen? If we go into Romans <coughs> chapter 15, and in verse 4, <coughs> the Apostle Paul says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning. And so, what Paul is speaking of here, the things that were written aforetime, is Old Testament Scripture. And so, Old Testament Scripture was written that we might learn from it. If we're not reading Old Testament Scripture, as because many teach it is irrelevant, we're not learning. And we can't learn what the Old Testament Scriptures teach. We're also told in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, by the Apostle Paul, that all Scripture is profitable. It is given by the inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine. That is teaching that all Scripture includes Old Testament Scripture. It is profitable for, for teaching that you might learn from them. When we study, we find Scripture talks about two resurrections. And if we go into Acts chapter 24, Paul speaks of these two resurrections and he says of them in verse 15 and have hope towards God which they themselves ought to allow that there should be a resurrection of the dead both of the just and of the unjust. Hallelujah. So here God speaks of two resurrections. A resurrection of the just, that is of the godly, and a resurrection of the unjust, that is the ungodly. What, what Paul says here is based on Old Testament Scripture. All Paul's writings are based on Old Testament Scripture. If we go into Daniel chapter 12, in Daniel chapter 12 and in verse 2, it says that many of them sleep in the dust of the earth, shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So here the prophet Daniel is also prophesying of two resurrections. One of the dead, the, the righteous dead, one of the ungodly dead. Hallelujah. Jesus also spoke 
of two resurrections. We see this in John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 29. says, And it shall come and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. That is the resurrection of the just. And they that have done good unto the, uh, done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That is the resurrection of the unjust. Hallelujah. These two resurrections are spoken of by the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 20. So if we go to Revelation chapter 20, I'll just read what it says from verse 4. And I, and I saw thrones and there that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, and received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead, the rest of, that is the ungodly dead, the rest of the dead, they lived not again till the end of the thousand years. This is the first resurrection, not the resurrection of the ungodly dead. That's the second resurrection. The first resurrection is the resurrection of the godly dead, whom the ones in verse 4 who are beheaded for the witness of Jesus are a part of. They are a part of the first resurrection. And we will look at this a bit, a bit closer shortly. Hallelujah. So, question. When does the first resurrection occur? And what is it? We have already read it is the resurrection of the godly, the just. But there is more to it than just that. Who are the just? Who are the unjust? Well, we search the scriptures. We read the scriptures and it tells us, doesn't it? The just are those that are saved. The just are those that are saved. The unjust are those that are not saved. It's very simple. It's very simple. It's very, very simple. It's not just about being saved, though. It's about being saved and doing what you've been saved to do. And that requires obedience to God's word. Because we are told, if we go into Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, I said to you earlier that Paul always used the Old Testament for his teachings. And here he says in verse 16 and 17, he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the gospel of Christ, when you study it correctly, is the Old Testament where Jesus said, Moses and all the prophets wrote of me. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein the gospel of Christ is the righteousness of God revealed, that is Jesus, from faith to faith. From faith to faith. Hallelujah. For the just, for the just, that's the justified ones, the just shall live by faith. 
That's how they live. And that's how they keep living, is they live by faith. And faith, we are told, in Romans chapter 10, comes by hearing the word. But not just hearing the word, but also doing what you are hearing. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. To do the word of God. Hallelujah. And the just, the justified ones, they shall live by faith. The unjust ones don't. And that is the difference. They do not live by the word. Hallelujah. Paul, as I said, uses Old Testament scripture. And Paul is quoting this, the just shall live by faith, from Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. So if you want to turn over to Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, where the last part of the sentence said, the just shall live by faith. And so Paul knew the Old Testament scriptures, like with the saying, like the back of his hand. Hallelujah. And that's what he wrote his letters of concerning them. How does faith come or grow? By hearing the word. Romans 10, 17. Before we are born again, the scripture tells us we were spiritually dead. The body's alive, but because of sin coming through the bloodstream from Adam, all have sinned, our spirits are dead. Spiritually dead. No life in it. Without life. This is why Jesus came. That they that would believe would be born again so that life would come into the spirit and the spirit would be raised up, given life again. Hallelujah. If we go over into Ephesians chapter 2, and in verse 1 it says, You, Paul saying this, you had he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Also in verse uh, 5 and, and I think verse 6 as well. Even when we were dead in sins, has he quickened us together with Christ. Verse 6, and he has raised us up. So, if he has raised us up, and we were dead and we were raised up, is not that a resurrection? But it is not a resurrection of the body, because the body contains the spirit, and the spirit is dead, but when life came in, the spirit resurrected. The spirit was given life. Hallelujah. So once we're born again, our spirits are renewed, our spirits are quickened, our spirits are given life. And so the resurrection of the dead is not a, a literal resurrection of people from the dead, but a spiritual one. But a spiritual one. Hallelujah. When we die, Scripture tells us our spirits go back, go to heaven, go back to God who gave it. 
they do not go back into the ground to be raised up from the grave in the ground. They don't go from there to there to be raised up. They never come back. They're up there and they don't go back into the grave. To be raised from the grave as many preach. The resurrection is. If we read, go back into John chapter 5. We've already read verse 29. Let's go back to verse 25. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. If you were in the grave, you can't hear the voice of the Son of God you're dead. What is the voice of the Son of God? When we study the voice of the Son of God is the Word. And the way we hear the Word is when somebody speaks it to us. So if you are dead in the grave, you can't hear the Word of God that gives you life. That your resurrection comes from. So he's talking about a spiritual resurrection. They that are dead in trespasses and sins, they shall hear the voice, the word of God, and they shall live. Glory to God. The Bible is the words God spoke, written by man, and what God spoke is his voice. He voiced the words he spoke. If we go into John chapter 11, again, Jesus said, in answer to Martha, Martha said in verse 21, then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. He said, I know that even now, she said, but I know that even now, Whatsoever you will ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. And she said, I know this, that he shall rise in the resurrection at the last day. Hallelujah. And that's what they believed. But it wasn't quite scripturally correct. Jesus said unto her, to correct her. When Jesus spoke, he was speaking to bring correction. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me, shall never die. Do you believe this? Now let me read it again and do it my way. <coughs> Jesus said, I am past tense. Oh, sorry, present tense. I am now present tense. I am 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead in trespasses and sins, if he hears the voice of God, he shall live. And he that lives, that has believed in me, and continues to believe in me, shall never die. Do you believe this? Those that believe that will go to heaven. Hallelujah. When they die. We don't, you know, 
Hallelujah. Glory to God. If we, uh, this die, this dying, they shall never die. He, he's not speaking of they shall never die in the body. But this was 2,000 years ago. And people have been dying for 2,000 years. So what was he talking about? Spiritually. Spiritually, they shall never die. They were dead. They believe in him. Their spirits will never die again. Their spirits will never die again. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verse, I'll read from verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, prevent, prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, from this, mainly from these verses, has come a, the doctrine which they call the rapture teaching. Now, when I read this, I have many questions. And because I want to rightly divide the word, I want to know who are those that are still alive unto the coming of the Lord? Who are the dead in Christ? And what is this rising first? And where do they rise from? Because the rapture teaching teaches that they rise from the grave at the coming of Christ. But how can they rise from the grave if the spirits are not in the grave? If the spirits have gone already back to God who gave it, how can they rise? Did the spirits come back from heaven? and go back into the grave so they can rise? I think not. Because the scripture says, if we read from verse 13, that he actually brings them with him. Which we'll read later. The dead in Christ, when studied correctly, are all the righteous, the just, the ones that have lived by his word, all the way back to Adam. Do you know many? You know, under the law, they had to live by the law. And if they lived by the law, it made them righteous and they went to heaven. Although we know the scripture says there's none righteous, but yet Abraham was righteous, Noah was righteous. What about Lot? What did God say of Lot? Not Lot. Um, not Lot, um, Job. What did God say of Job? Do you know what God said of Job? He was a righteous man. So, righteous men go to heaven. Because righteous men, when you study what Job was doing, 
for his for himself and for his family, what was he doing, do you know? He kept offering sacrifices. Because that's what he'd been told to do, to cover his sin. And so if he's doing what God told him to do, makes him righteous, and the righteous live, they go to heaven. Hallelujah. At the death of your body, whether it be now or in five years' time or whatever it might be, if you died before Christ came back, so that also includes them that have already died, going all the way back to Adam. When their body dies, the scripture tells us what happens to the spirit. The scriptures tell us that the spirit of man must go up. Saved or unsaved, it must go up back to God who gave it and God is in God is dwelling in heaven and heaven is paradise. Paradise is a part of heaven where God is dwelling. It's the third heaven. Paul tells us it's the third heaven. Now so we have Paul, the Apostle Paul, telling us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 of a man who died and went into paradise. So let's have a read of what he says. Second Corinthians 12, verse 2. He says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows such a one, caught up to the third heaven. I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows, how that he was caught up into paradise. Now, the person that he's speaking of, I believe, is himself. And he didn't know whether he'd been caught up in his body into paradise or whether out of the body his spirit had been caught up into paradise. Now, to be caught up into paradise, you have to be dead. And as I said, I believe Paul was speaking of himself. And... This occurred in Acts chapter 14 where Paul was stoned to death by the Jews. When Jews stoned you, they stoned you according to the law and the last stone they stone you with is a big stone to make sure you're dead by dropping it on your head. Just to make sure. There are different things that you were stoned for. You were stoned for fornication. You were stoned for committing adultery. You were stoned for... for um, blasphemy, and these Jews had heard Paul preaching, and I believe they believed he was speaking blasphemy, and so they stoned him according to the law, and for blasphemy you were stoned to death if you study the law, so Paul was stoned to death. And in the time that they, his disciples picked his, or the disciples with him, picked his body up and carried him out of the city 
put him down as dead, his spirit came back into his body. Now, I don't know how long that period of time had been, but I know, I know that, uh, say for example, if heaven was in the sun, it takes eight minutes to get from here to the sun at the speed of light, because we're light beings. At the speed of light, it takes eight minutes, and eight is the number four resurrection. So if it takes eight minutes to get there, it would take eight minutes to get back, so that's 16 minutes. So he was killed at like 16 minutes before that. At least. Enough time for him to go up into paradise to see things that he couldn't speak about. His body didn't go up, they carried his body out. It was his spirit that went up. He had died and his spirit went up into paradise. Why? Why did his spirit go up? Why did his spirit go up there? Well, we also have in, in, uh, in Luke, 40, Luke 23, we have Jesus on the cross. And there are two thieves crucified with him, one on, either, one on either side. One of the thieves says to him, said, but the other answer, verse 40, but the other answer rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God, seeing that you are in the same condemnation? We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now we know God looks upon the heart. And so Jesus is looking on his heart and he's actually seeing repentance for what he'd done. And so Jesus says to him, I don't forget at this time of this man dying on the cross, are they still under the law? Are they still under the law? Why, do, why, yes. Because the scripture says, Jesus came to fulfill the law. And under the law, he had to spend three days and three nights in the grave. So on the cross, he hadn't spent three days and three nights in the grave, so the law hadn't yet finished. It only finished once he had resurrected to fulfill the law. Do you get that? Can you hear that? Verse 43, And Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Today you shall be with me in paradise. Now, the guy, the guy's body wasn't going to paradise. The guy was going to die on the cross. Jesus' body wasn't going to paradise. His, his body was always put in the grave. But so was the, the other guy with him. So what went to paradise? His spirit went to paradise. In verse 46, Jesus said, when Jesus cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands, Father's in paradise, I commend my spirit. I commit my spirit to you. Now, as I said before, in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus said, I have not come to do away with the law, but I have come to fulfill that which the law and the prophets said. And so, Jesus' spirit and the man's spirit had to fulfill the law. They, the spirit had to fulfill 
the law concerning what the Spirit has to do. And so, if we go into Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the law and the prophets. Well, the preacher who wrote this is King Solomon. Hallelujah. And they're all the writers are prophets of God in one way or another. They're writing down what God said. Verse 20, he says, All go on to one place, all of the dust, and all turn to dust again. That's speaking of the body. Who knows the spirit of man that goes upward? So at the death of the body, the spirit that's in man goes upward. That's what he says. The spirit goes upward. It does not go down. If we read Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and verse 7, it says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return to God who gave it. So that even makes it clearer that the Spirit now not just goes upward, but it returns to God who gave it in the first place. And God is up. God is in heaven. Hallelujah. Glory to God. As I said earlier, this is all spirits. Saved and unsaved. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> saved and unsaved. The saved spirit when we study the Word of God, is clothed. The unsaved spirit is naked. <coughs> now, who did God speak to in Isaiah 60? Let's have a look at Isaiah 60. <coughs> because this is in the Old Testament. This is in the Old Testament, it's not in the New. Sorry, Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. <coughs> if they are doing righteously, we are, whether, you know, to be saved, we are clothed with a garment of salvation. And that garment of salvation is our protection when we go back to God, who gave our spirit. Our, it, that, it, it's not. The, the, the garment of salvation is not my outward clothing. It's clothing that clothes my spirit and stops it from being naked. When we read Revelation chapter 3, it talks about buy of me gold tried so that you are not naked. Buy white raiment so you are not naked. That is speaking of your spirit being naked. Hallelujah. So salvation, when we give our life to Jesus, we're given a garment. Them that are not saved have got no garment. They're naked. So that's why when we go into Luke chapter 16, and we read what Jesus said in Luke 16, I love where Je I am. 
and I knew, or there was, in Luke 16 and verse 19, Jesus said, there was a certain rich man and there was a beggar. Now, I do have a little bit of education, not really that much, but I have a little bit of education, and I do know that was is past tense. The was is past tense. Now, when Jesus was speaking, there was a rich man and there was a beggar. Was this under the new covenant or the old? It was under the old covenant. It was under the law. Because Jesus was still alive. He hadn't gone to the cross. So he's saying there was, past tense, a rich man, and, and this is what happened to them. He said, I knew, I knew them. Hallelujah. If we read from verse 22, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. But the rich man also had died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And said, Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So, where are they? The beggar's in Abraham's bosom. Where's Abraham? He's in heaven. The rich man has gone to hell. This word hell comes from the Greek word Hades. And Hades means the place or state of departed spirits, spirits that have left their bodies. And not, they are naked spirits, spirits that are not clothed, go to hell, to this Hades. Where is the flame? What is the flame that this, that the spirit of this rich man is burning in? What is the flame? Well, again, we have to study rightly dividing the word. If we go into Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 29, the Apostle Paul says, again quoting from Old Testament Scripture, my God is a consuming fire. Chapter 12, 29, is it? Sorry, not. 12:29. For our God is a consuming fire. And the scriptures given for that are Deuteronomy and etc. Our God is a consuming fire. Is our God a consuming fire? How do you see your God? Well, I know how the prophet Ezekiel saw him. When Ezekiel saw him in a vision, Ezekiel saw him as fire. So let's have a look in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1. Our God is a consuming fire. In Ezekiel 1 and verse 13, as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. And like the appearance of lamps, it went up and down among the living creatures. 
and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightnings, etc. Down in verse 26 to 28, and above the firmament that was over their head was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Who sits on the throne? God does. And I saw as the color of amber as the appearance of fire round about within it. For the appearance of his loins, even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw it as it were the appearance of fire fire and it had brightness round about and the appearance of the bull that is in the cloud in the day of rain so was the appearance of the brightness round about this appearance was as the glory of the Lord the glory of the Lord is as fire again to confirm this we go into Daniel Daniel chapter 7. And in Daniel 7, and what he saw in Daniel 7 verse 9, I beheld, Daniel says, till the thrones were cast down, and the ancients of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream come out from him. That's what the rich man was feeling. Because the rich man's spirit had gone back to God who gave it, but it was naked, and he could feel the fire coming from God, and so he couldn't pass through the fire into God's presence because he was burning in the flame. That's scripture. That's rightly dividing the word. There is another word used in the New Testament for hell, and that word is Gehenna. And Gehenna is the place of the place or state of everlasting fire. Not temporary. Not a temporary holding place, like Hades is, but everlasting fire. Hallelujah. If we study the word as we're supposed to do, and we read Revelation 20, we are told from verse Revelation 20, verse, I'll read from verse 12. He said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to the, their works. And the sea gave up the dead which was in it. And death and hell, death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. This word hell here is Hades. Hades delivered up the ones that were in it. Verse 14, And death and hell, Hades, were cast into the lake of fire of death. So hell is a temporary place the lake of fire being the everlasting place of torment must be Gehenna. Must be Gehenna. The place of everlasting torment. Well, we find in verse nine, chapter 19, verse 19, the two beasts of Revelation 13 are cast into the lake of fire. Where also Satan is cast into the lake of fire with them. Hallelujah. 
verse 10, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of, just so that you know, he's also cast into the lake of fire by the one who had the right to do so. That is Jesus. That's chapter 20, verse 10. Now, if we go back into verse 4, I'm going to read from verse 4 through 8. And I saw thrones, and there that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead, that is the ungodly dead, the unjust dead, he said, they live not again till after the thousand years. So if they live not again, if they lived again after the thousand years, that means they must have been resurrected. And this is the second resurrection of those, the un who raises them from the dead? Satan. Because he's the one, if you read it, he's the one that deceives them. Again, he's deceived them all their living life. Now he's going to deceive them again in their dying life. This is the first resurrection. Those that are killed in verse 4, they take part in the first resurrection. And the second death, that is, the one spoken of as the lake of fire, has no power over them. Because that's where they're not going there. They shall be priests of God. They shall reign with them a thousand years. But when the thousand years is expired, Satan shall be loose out of his prison and he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, and gather them together to, the, to, to battle the number of their whom is the sand of the sea. He raises, they're already dead. They've been dead a thousand years. And he raises them from the dead. And God comes, God sends fire down from heaven and destroys them again. Why? Because he can. Because he's God. And he's just proving to Satan that, Satan, why don't you just stop it? Verse 4, I saw thrones and them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. If you're a witness of Jesus, you're speaking about him. You know about Jesus. These who were witnessing of Jesus, they were killed by the beast because they wouldn't worship his image or take his name or his mark. Where did that occur? It occurred in Revelation 13. When did that occur? During the last 42 months. Because we're told in Revelation, turn to Revelation 13. Revelation 13, it says, And these were given unto him, a mouth speaking great things, and black, verse 5, and blasphemy, and it was given unto him to continue for 42 months. So power was given to the two beasts for 42 months. 
And we know at the end of these 42 months, in chapter 19, in chapter 19, verse 19 and 20, Jesus comes back and takes them and casts them into the lake of fire. This is the last 42 months before Jesus returns. Hallelujah. Who are the ones he killed by cutting off the head? Who are they? During this last 42 months. It says in verse, um, verse 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. How did he, chapter 13, verse 7, how did he overcome them? He overcame them by killing him, killing them. He made war with them, and they, and he, he killed them. Again, who are they? Who are they? Who are they? You go back into Revelation 12, Verse 17, it tells you. Revelation 12, verse 17 says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, that's the woman of Revelation 1, and went to make war with the remnant of the woman's seed, who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They have the witness of Jesus Christ. And he kills them. They are the ones who do not make the woman group. The woman, when studied correctly, is the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. And these, these remnants have not measured up to be a part of the bride. They were not... They were not willing, as you go back into verse 11, it says, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Do you love your life unto the death? Your life has really got to mean nothing because it's all about him in you. If you love your life, Jesus said, if you love your life, you'll lose it. But if you don't, you'll gain it. These are the remnant of the woman's seed, the woman being the bride of Christ. When we study the word and we go into, uh, into Matthew 25, it talks about five wise and five foolish virgins go out to meet the bridegroom when he comes with his bride. Five are wise, five are foolish. And we find that the foolish have the door to the wedding feast closed on them. They are the remnant they cannot go through the three and a half years. Same, this same three and a half years is the same three and a half years that the beast rules all the planet for 42 months. And they, they can't go, they're not taken out into the wilderness as the woman is and protected by God. They are left in the world. They are left in the world. They're not raptured out. They are killed. They are Christians. They stay in the world. They are not raptured out. They are killed by the beast. And that's the only way they can make it into heaven. But by having their heads cut off, the spirits go worse. Back to God who gave it. 
And therefore, by the spirits going back to God who gave it, they fulfill the first resurrection. Hallelujah. There is not two resurrections of the just, there is only one. There is not one before the tribulation and one after. There is just one, and it is after, at the end of the 42 months, at Christ's return. The dead in Christ shall rise first. That is, all those that, are, that die in Christ from Adam to Jesus' second coming, including these that have their heads cut off. And those that are still alive, that's the woman of Revelation 12, those that are still alive unto the coming of the Lord should not prevent them that have already died because they're up there already. But they that are still alive shall rise. They shall rise. Jesus rose. Do you know at, at his ascension, Jesus rose. Do you remember that? Jesus, at his ascension, he rose. And there was two angels there, two men. And they said, as you have seen this Jesus go, he will come back in like manner in the clouds. And when you read, he's coming in the clouds. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he's coming in the clouds. And Scripture says, every eye will see him. And there'll be a wailing and gnashing of teeth. Because when he comes back, he's coming back in flaming fire. Because our God is a consuming fire. Hallelujah. Let's go back into 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and we'll finish here. And I'll read from verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That's them that have died in Christ. that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, then that have died in him, shall he bring with him. And there that he brings with him, they are the clouds. Hebrews 12, 1, a great cloud of witnesses. Ones that have already died, all the way back to Adam. Where is the, where is the beggar sitting? Where is the beggar sitting? He's sitting in Abraham's bosom. Why is this? I'll just finish with this scripture in Luke, in Matthew 22. <clears throat> Matthew 22. Matthew 22, verse 29. Jesus answered and said, talking about the resurrection, Jesus answered and said, unto, you do err, not knowing the Scriptures. And the problem is, many do err because they wrongly divide the Scriptures. For in the resurrection... They neither marry or are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am, Jesus said, I am the resurrection of the life. Here he's now saying, I am, again, present tense, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am not the God 
of the dead, but of the living. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you.